A very good evening to one and all present here. In the play called The Life of King Henry VIII, Shakespeare has said this, A good company, a good wine and a good welcome can make people good. Due to restrictions, we have changed the wine with the high tea and hence a good company, good tea and a good welcome can make this event a memorable one. May I now request Mr. N. Dilip Kumar, Chairman of Legal Literacy Club MMBA, to give the welcome address. A very pleasant good evening to all of you. It is a great honor to be the Chairman of MMBA Legal Literacy Club. Today, I have the privilege to extend our warmest welcome to our disciplinarian, Honorable Dr. Justice G. Jayachandran, MMBA Legal Literary Club is organizing this program for the benefit of our legal fraternity. I, on behalf of MMBA, heartily welcome our chief guest, star speaker, our great resource person, Honorable Dr. Justice G. Jayachandran, who is well known for his legal acumen, profound knowledge and simplicity. Despite his very busy schedule, amidst all his judicial work, administrative work and various other commitments, his lordship readily agreed to address us. The moment we made a request, we thank you, my lord. Seventeen years, eight months and twenty-five days ago, a young lawyer at the bar of forty years of age with a doctorate in narcotics control and a lucrative practice accepted the responsibility to be a judge and has arisen to be an epitome of hard work and expeditious delivery of justice. My Lord never hesitates to decide and in fact decides swiftly. Judge, we are grateful for your ready acceptance to be our speaker and deliver on this fascinating topic, writs past, present and future. It kindles the curiosity of everyone. Our speaker judge in his illustrious career had decided lot of cases and laid down the legal principles always with a heart that beats for the larger welfare of the society. A youth involved in illegal bike racing was ordered to assist in the trauma ward of the government general hospital. Interest on solatium was ordered to landowners in acquisition. Premature release of convicts, drawing of voice samples, ADMK leadership dispute, Several writ petitions, writ appeals, civil and criminal appeals, and the list is endless. This shows the erudition of our speaker of the day. He is a resource person for the National Judicial Academy, as well as various other state judicial academy, including ours. I welcome his lordship, Honorable Dr. Justice G. J. Chandran, to the occasion. I welcome our president, our office bearers, our beloved secretary, senior advocates, TSR Venkatramana sir and other senior members, our own senior counsel Mr. A. Arumugam sir and young lawyers, print and electronic media and viewers in the network channel as well. I welcome one and all. Thank you. True honor is an outflow from the heart. May I now request the chairman of Legal Literacy Club of MMBA Mr. N. Dilip Kumar to honor our honorable Dr. Justice G. Jayachandran with a memento. Thank you Lord Chu. Thank you, sir. Legal Literacy Club has been an actively functioning club of MMBA throughout these years. And in every function, we take pride in giving a valuable knowledge or information to the bar and to the fraternity with the assist of our wonderful resource persons. Today, we have someone who is not just a judge, but also a great scholar, great academician, great orator, the one who doesn't need an introduction. But for the sake of formality, I'm reiterating the following, which we were well aware of. 
Our Lordship was born from an agricultural family, finished his schooling at Vellore and joined law college at Chennai in the year 1983, where our Lordship belongs to the first batch of five years integrated law course. Our Lordship joined ML in the Department of Legal Studies at Madras, Madras University and shared the first rank in ML. In the year 2001, our Lordship was conferred with a doctorate in law by the University of Madras for the thesis on trafficking and control of narcotic drugs in India. Our Lordship enrolled as an advocate on 1988 and been in the office of many stalwarts. Our Lordship along with our uh, Lordship P.N. Prakash and Mr. S. Yes, Rajendra Kumar has established a law firm namely Norton and Grant and handled cases before both trial courts and appellate courts. In the year 1998, our Lordship was appointed as Additional Central Government Standing Council to represent Central Government in Madras High Court. Under the tutelage of late P. Rajamanikam, the legendary prosecutor, handled cases of NCB and CBI in the respective special courts since 1996. Also served as Special Public Prosecutor of CBI in trial courts at Chennai. Assumed charge as District Judge at Trichy in the year 2005. elevated as a judge of madras high court in the year 2016 yes i would like to invite the befitting resource person to enlighten us with his rich experience to the topic writ, writ jurisdiction past present and future none other than our honorable dr j jayachandran judge of madras high court lordship the podium is yours good evening friends I had a good coffee nice company and a very good welcome thank you for that thank you <laughs> and uh, i thank for the presence of two great seniors of this bar because i used to play like a kid with them in the court i used to provoke them <laughs> but <laughs> uh, and i used to get the best of out of them and both of them are here thank you sir thank you for a valuable presence it gives me an immense pleasure and uh, some extra uh, motivation to be with you and me and share my experience and ideas about the writ jurisdiction what is a writ what does writ means nowhere in the constitution writ is defined but writ is referred explained in a different way and not only in indian constitution in other constitutions also it is not been defined because it is a word which has been in use even before Magna Carta. In London, the command of the king considered as writ, and the dictionary meaning of writ is a formal order in writing issued under seal in the name of sovereign government, court, or other authorities commanding an officer. or other person to whom it is issued to do or refrain from doing some act specified therein so but it is need, need not be defined also because it is in our blood all advocates know even general public know a writ is something a superior sort of an order from an higher authority they all know and that is how it has been understood and if you look at the indian constitution article 32 and article 226 they say about kinds of writ these are all very rudimentary but to refresh your memory and to as an introduction i i'm bound to say about this a few uh, thing about all these writs before going to the uh, topic and i'll say hey, why i thought that this this can be a topic of interest for us because of late i feel that we are in the cross road after 73 years of republic first in 70s we had some crisis constitutional crisis good fortune to this country we were able to get over it and the, all the institutions good thinking people has reinforced and uh, had saved the democracy and constitution so long again 
there are some dark clouds certain misunderstanding of the constitution and the powers of the, all the three wings been propagated and therefore we the members of the bar are bound to safeguard it and prevent derailment i will not say that it's going to derail or there is there may be some attempt and that derailment should not occur and it will not occur if everybody believe that constitution is supreme and constitution cannot be tinkered with and our forefathers have put their mind heart and soul and has given this wonderful constitution which has saved this country which will save this country and many people think and say that our democracy is something a miracle because many all our neighboring state all the country also could not sustain democracy after getting independence but we were able to sustain it's all because of the internal fabric of every indian it is and that is reflected in our constitution if you look into the constitution debate right from preamble to the end you will see that how much effort taken by the members the quality of discussion the reasoning whether for an amendment or in support everything will be quite interesting and we will understand that not even a single article in our constitution is superfluous they have contemplated everything because our constitution assembly members from all walks of life lawyers non lawyers businessmen industries everybody were there and they have contributed for framing this constitution and therefore we hope and pray that this constitution will survive for years to come but for that it cannot survive without support and without honoring the constitution respecting the constitution that's the reason i want to choose this topic and i will share my random reflection thoughts with you rather than uh, saying what is right and how it is to be applied and other thing because writ as it is undefined but by practice we know what is writ it is so flexible so flexible earlier now and in, even in future it will be flexible now as a foundation information uh, writ five kinds we know that as far as constitution is concerned we have named five sort of five kinds of writ and uh, mandamus normally we say that mandamus to command for that there must be a demand and refusal there some of the advocates may not know that there must be a demand and refusal only then writ of mandamus can be filed even without demand they may come to the court and file a writ of mandamus but the basic requirement is demand and refusal and the demand must be directed to the person was the power to exercise your request uh, to consider your request not to some wrong person so when there is a failure to exercise the power you make a demand there is a refusal or non exercise of power then writ of mandamus will lie the certiorari is to certify to certify whether it is in accordance with law or not so negatively we come to court file a writ of certiorari saying that it is not in accordance with law for example constitutional amendments can be challenged saying that it is not been amended in the manner as contemplated under the constitution 368 says power to con- amend the constitution but how to do it if it is a uh, state list state a uh, concurrent list if it is in union list how it is to be done whether it ratified by 50% of the state whether it has been passed by a uh, special majority all these things will be taken into account and then thereafter they will also find out whether uh, this amendment touches upon or shakes the basic structure of the constitution this concept after kesan and the bar the case in 1973 we have formulated that yes you have power to amend the constitution but don't touch the basic structure what is basic structure is at another moot question and debatable point they have been enumerating 
several concepts as basic structure that may increase or that may sometimes in future some may say that no no presidential form of a, a, a union a type federal form of government is uh, need not be a basic structure that can be removed or this can be removed this can be added it may happen it all how our judiciary is going to work and how the judiciary is going to be fed by the lawyers community because anything may happen everybody any kind of person may occupy the seat and it is all how the bar also reacts to that and you all know that what happened this basic structure case when review was sought for and the bar very very uh, firmly said that who asked for review and that is a matter of history so what we expect is a bar such a vigilant bar is always required not only in normal days and turbulent days also it must be so vigilant that this basic structure of the constitution could not be touched and any attempt is made that has to be aborted at the earliest this is what is now required now we will go to the constitution the touchstone is whether constitutional amendment violates the basic structure or take away the basic structure or takes the basic structure other plenary provisions legislations are there that can also be challenged that can be also challenged on the legislative competency for example if central government is going to pass an act which or a subject which is in the state list and if they are going to use their oh, inherent power that has to be tested whether they are infringing in the uh, powers of the state exclusive powers of the state this may occur in case of law and order and other thing where the way in which they say this is this statute falls under this entry of the seventh schedule this is therefore the competency of the state is there competency of the central is there vice versa this may happen so whenever a legislation is passed we have to first to find out even while drafting that will be there how the assembly can uh, pass this resolution there will be a draft note we will say that this falls under this entry uh, uh, 3 5 21 25 like that we'll say that this all of falls under this subject therefore uh, state assembly has the competency to legislate on this subject but sometimes it may touch upon the powers of the central also usurping the power of the central if you are going to legislate saying that this falls under the entries of the state list that will be treated as a colorable exercise of the power colorable legislation these are all how uh, the manner in which how legislation is viewed how it is enacted on how it can be charged many times like this uh, gambling act press freedom and other things been quashed or uh, uh, nationalization of buses all these things the colorable legislation or uh, legislative competency will be questioned and if there is some provisions which touches upon the, the other list that will be quashed in all cases we get the violation of fundamental right if any fundamental right is violated by a legislation and not fall under the exceptions or restriction that will also be subjected that can be also be questioned by way of filing a writ of social and the repugnancy these are all some of the basic reasons under which a uh, legislation can be challenged and administrative actions there also writ of certiorari can be filed administrative action we all know that the basic uh, they say uh, the old case ek uh, kariya park uh, case where he himself will sit in the interview select his uh, known person bias so the bias and violation of national justice principle like adial compactum bias three kinds of bias are there these are all the reasons where we can question the administrative orders like uh, granting patta not granting patta refusal to give some uh, or uh, punishment all these things these are all the administrative orders that can be challenged on these grounds bias arbitrariness unreasonableness excessive excesses of power sometimes if a person is given a power to do a uh, pass order within the such limit he may pass an order exceeding exceeding his power so 
uh, the violation of natural gas treaty. These are all the grounds on which a writ of certiorari, challenging an administrative order, can be passed. Prohibition is to prevent. This is normally this writ of prohibition rarely we file or resort to. That is against the a higher court, that is high court or supreme court, giving a direction or an order to the lower court do this or do or not to do this. Continue the, the so proceedings, not to continue the proceedings. We file the writ, but normally we will uh, couch our prayer in a way of mandamus or dispose the matter. Uh, ma case is pending, dispose the matter within six weeks like this. Or we will file a transfer petition saying that this must be heard by some other something like that. So all these things we we have, we will we have invented and we do it. And uh, the reason why they have mentioned only five writs. And and all those things, I will be the constitutional debate for you. Then we'll understand that why they have restricted this five rates alone, and uh, that's the reason why I, I, in the outset itself said that our framers of the constitution are wise enough and uh, good-hearted persons. They want to give a constitution to the persons for the progeny for generations to come and save the things. That is why they have thought of it, why we should say this five rate alone. You let us not mention. Supreme Court has a power to issue it. Why not to do that? And for that, a very good answer has been given. And I will, if time permits, I will read that. Debate itself is so quite interesting. Now, under what authority a person can hold a post? If some person doesn't have a required qualification, but they hold a post or a post is offered to them, this quarantine will be. There are some famous cases regarding this quarantine, infamous cases also. <laughs> This, uh, we may know that uh, in 70s, I know that in uh, the 80s, when uh, M.G. Ramachandran wants to make uh, Valamburi Jan as a Raj Sabha MP, he was not even 35 years old. At that time, the Kauranto was filed, and he, since he doesn't have the minimum age qualification, Valamburi Jan, M.G. And when he had a Nirmala, uh, declared insolvent, undisturbed insolvent, uh, uh, nominated as MLC. That was questioned by way of a quaranto. This, these things will happen. And uh, for that purpose, the writ of quaranto is used. Then, the most often uh, uh, exploited thing is <laughs> habeas corpus. In fact, habeas corpus is the, um, among the five writs, habeas corpus is the more important writ because it touches upon the life and liberty of a person. Other things are all your honor, prestige, power, post and everything. This is life and liberty of a person, Sabus Corpus writ. And uh, uh, this, in fact, uh, no, it is uh, exploited or uh, it has been abused to some extent. But uh, nevertheless, it is, it is to be there in the statute and it has to be popularized more, undoubtedly. And this you all know that uh, regarding a, a detention, illegal detention of a person. In fact, the interesting point in this writ is that earlier this, quorum, uh, this habeas corpus writ used to be issued by the king to bring a person for punishment. Bring the body not to release him from illegal custody but to punish him. It is something like a warrant, non-bailable warrant. The higher degree of non-bailable warrant was the warrant. Bring the body. King will punish him. Thereafter, he will call him. What is that? You have not uh, followed this starter. You have not followed my whip. That is what uh, olden days. But now it is used positively to release a person in a prison, detained illegally, or uh, confined or detained by any individual. This writ of uh, habeas corpus, right? And uh, now uh, constitutionalism. This is what we are. We must be very fond of this word. We must be very fond of and we have to protect it at all costs. And wh what is that constitution? It is an attempt established to supremacy of law. In a country like India, where we have diversified uh, characters, religion, language, and uh, a very forcible and powerful binding factor being the religion. And that religion is known for tolerance. And uh, that religion has the character of accepting diversified views into this fold. These are all the unique feature of this country. This unique feature of this country 
has made us to survive all along despite humpty number of onslaughts many persons across a country um, other than our race have seen this place they were attracted by the natural resources attracted by the wealth attracted by the culture and more than that they have envied our way of life and the way in which we are able to survive in spite of all odds we have seen famine we have seen flood we have seen uh, foreign attacks everything and we have seen internal disturbances but we are able to survive because the internal character of this uh, um, uh, citizens of this country and therefore this supremacy of law is always inbuilt within us that has been now reflected in our constitution and this constitutionalism we say that it is an attempt to establish the supremacy of law and all along we have been reinforcing it and upholding the supremacy of law whenever and wherever need arises and therefore this word supremacy of law should always be in our mind that this must be preserved protected saved and the progeny should know that law is supreme nothing else is supreme if that is to be followed in the, in our court in our uh, regular uh, day to day life in administration of executives then we need not fear of anything else and judicial review is the exercise of power by the superior courts to test the legality of any government or state state action that's how the writ comes so the any state actions if it is to be challenged that is challenged in the court by way of a judicial review the judiciary reviews their action whether it is within the framework of constitution whether there is any violation whether there is malafide whether there is an arbitrariness or whether there is any excessive exercise of power or in the case of mandamus whether there is a non exercise uh, exercise of the power vested with the person that is how this judicial review functions and judicial review as far as uh, the case on and the party case is concerned they say that it is one of the basic structure of a constitution and it is the very life breath of the constitution of a vibrant working constitutional democracy it is this power that is judicial review is the power and jurisdiction that is most frequently and potentially invoked and exercised by issue of the writs that's the reason this uh, writ judicial review saving the rule of law uh, supremacy of law that is the reason why the writ been uh, power to issue writ been given to the high court and supreme court and as far as supreme court is concerned you all know that it is confined to fundamental right whereas for any other purpose writ can be issued by the high court to that extent the power of the high court is much larger than the power conferred to the supreme court so far as any other purpose the word any other purpose makes the difference whereas supreme court it is restricted to in uh, regarding part 3 of the constitution which deals support the fundamental but one special thing about 32 is 32 itself is a fundamental right article 32 itself is in the part 3 unlike 226 therefore 32 though it may say that the issue uh, supreme court can issue right to safeguard the uh, fundamental rights but that the power of the supreme court under the uh, conferred under 32 itself being a fundamental right of a citizen this right is more powerful and more vibrant and uh, that's the reason why dr ambedkar has said that this is the best uh, uh, article in the entire indian constitution I, if time permits i'll read that uh, portion also because article 32 was taken up for debate by this uh, constitutional assembly debate that was the second anniversary day of the constitutional assembly they have discussed all other articles most of the articles they have finalized article uh, draft article 25 is article 32 now article 32 that came for consideration 
all some amendments were also sought by some juridic persons a very good discussion will be there on it and and that day when this article was taken up they said that we are we have completed two years we are almost going to complete our article. and this article we are taking up for consideration because this article is going to article 32 the draft article 30, 25 is going to save the other articles it's going to save the other entire citizens who have resolved themselves to give a constitution for themselves that is how free members thought that this article is more important and they have accepted the, the way it is now drafted now past past to complete that portion of the past 60 of the bill these five writs are not the writs they are not alone the writs which are being in practice there were several absolute writs which were being invoked particularly in England and as well as in USA we we are we are following the parliament form of government and other thing we have an administration everything as uh, Britishers have given to us and it is also more suitable to us because they have molded uh, laws which will be suitable to our character and country and that is why some of the legislations they did not do it for their country but they took all pains to come over here legislated for us and that is uh, um, to the test of time even contracts act that was first enacted in India before England could have a law of contracts. So the absolute rates for, uh, for the sake of interest and information. Siri Fesia, this is to rescind the royal contract. It is something like cancelling the pata. Cancel the pata, don't grant, uh, give uh, this and that. Sometimes uh, they do it. That uh, Sisi Fesia is to rescind the royal grant given to a person. Uh, by issuing this writ, king will rescind the contract uh, grant given to him. Ni exit regno to prevent the subject from leaving the kingdom. It is like impounding the passport. You may all know the Managa Gandhi case. So if, this this is called as Ni exit regno. So king will if some uh, somebody. Uh, uh, wants to escape from the kingdom, go, uh, try to go to another kingdom, this writ will be issued. Don't leave the country, you will be there. And in normal, uh, nowadays in modern parlance, we call it as impounding the passport not to go abroad. And if the person tries to go abroad, if the passport is impounded, we have declared that right to travel abroad is a fundamental right, you can't go abroad. This is. And if you want to impound the passport, there are some uh, reasons to be stated. Then you can impound the passport, then you can refuse to renew the passport also or issue the passport. The passport act is now made, uh, it also amended and it's very clear on this point. You can, when a uh, criminal wants to file uh, or in convict uh, wants to go abroad, file, uh, uh, seek for a passport, they may refuse saying that a case is pending against you, we will not give you a passport or we, they may say you should not leave abroad. After the uh, getting an order from the court, he is permitted to go abroad with on condition to come back and all those things. These are all happening. Uh, if there is an uh, arbitrary exercise of power, court interferes and gives some protection to that. That is how modern days. This olden days, king used to say to uh, issue this writ and say, don't go from the country, finished. And uh, transfer, section 24. <laughs> Dean on Presidento Rigi in consulate to withdraw from the common law court the proceedings in which king claims interest. One difference is that the case will be withdrawn by the king to his court. Wherever there is a, there is one interesting uh, anecdote about that. Uh, I I forgotten the name king name and his friend. The king will appoint his friend as a judge. And that king is a person or is like a, some uh, playboy character. And he thought that his friend will help him and all these things and uh, he can get any order he likes. But once he unearths the bench, that man will behave like a judge. And the uh, king will get annoyed and he will call him, summon him, come 
or the other judge will say no i am the judge i will not come he will be here that's how the history got some um, a bucket or something i have forgotten the name that that's all those days when the king uh, this king uh, what command uh, and uh, what he says is the uh, law the, as asim used to say the uh, the command of the sovereign is law and the sovereign is the king and king can do no wrong in writ of evocation this is um, originally what was used in the canadian court and uh, this is where it wants a uh, want of or excess jurisdiction uh, this will be uh, this issue uh, writ will be issued it is something like equal to a seizure right and procedendo this is to compel the inferior court and tribunal to proceed to judge or restore jurisdiction this is also something like dispose the case within 6 months 5 months that the order being passed no supreme court says no you should not do that you can't direct the lower court to do that but this is something like that restitution to restore a party to the possession of the property of which he had been wrongfully deprived something like section 6 tp act so immediately a writ will be passed the disposes process a person must uh, be given possession and uh, quorum nobis to bring before the court rendered rendering the judgment matters of fact not appearing on the record and which if known at a time the judgment was rendered would have prevented its rendition this is review petition this writ is something like review petition these facts were not brought before them so why these all this writ has become obsolete is all these rights power are now and given or enumerated in the other statutes when other plenary statutes take care of it framers of our constitution thought that don't leave open supreme court high court will have power to issue it then they will pass all orders they use of the power or they will try to overdo they are meant for deciding constitutional issues don't allow them to wool gather saying that you have a power to do anything and everything you restrict that if you do, if they do that that itself is enough that will protect the constitution other things will take will be taken care by the other courts where we will give all this power and right in those respective states like specific relief act and other acts we can give this power they will do it like uh, uh, this uh, uh, impounding the passport and all the all other substantial uh, law we take care of that's the reason why they said that this five rights is enough now before going to the other thing i i think that i can read the two portions of the constitutional debate why there was only five rights and why there were they mentioned these five rights in the constitution and why they did not delete it though there was a strong debate and voter is for uh, deleting those five rights and without mentioning the nature of writ power must be given to supreme court, uh, supreme court. no so it may be a bit lengthy i think it is quite interesting the way the language they have used and uh, uh, the foresight and uh, their knowledge they don't know how this constitution is going to work you just imagine they have given a constitution contemplating several thing they had 1935 act of india with them constitutions of various country and 550 princely states more than uh, almost all religions were present in this country though it is predominantly dominated by hindus you name a religion there were some in some pocket those uh, persons professing those religion were there numerous language despite all these things these people, all this uh, the constitution uh, assembly members have put their mind and they have honestly worked for a constitution which is a um, masterpiece years to come and h v kamath is one of the best parliamentarian he was an amendment to draft uh, article 25 4 2 252 that the supreme court shall have power to issue such directions or orders or writs as it may consider necessary or appropriate for the enforcement of any of the rights conferred by this part this part 
mean part 3 fundamental rights so he says that this much is enough why you mention all these five rights for that he says at the outset you, uh, follow the language that he has used at the outset let me make it clear that i am a mere layman and not a professional lawyer or a or a legal or constitutional expert like my friend dr ambedkar but i know a bit of law though not very much of it and i will have my say on the basis of a little knowledge of law which i possess this clause of clause of article 25 relates to the power of the supreme court to issue orders for the enforcement of any of the fundamental rights mentioned in part 3 i think that so far as the supreme court is concerned it is not necessary to lay down what particular writ it should issue after all sir it may be that with the growth of legal and constitutional precedents other writs than these mentioned here in this article may be evolved and whatever a particular case comes up before the supreme court it may be that the court will take all the aspects of the case into consideration and issue such a writ might be one of these or a new writ may be evolved i think this particular clause of the article is a very regrettable instance to my mind of what is called in legislation legislation by inference so don't infer and pass uh, in at a legislation future we may evolve various other writs also why you restrict with this five writs so now you i will go to the reply by dr ambedkar while the powers of the supreme court to issue orders and direction are there the draft constitution has thought it desirable to mention these particular writs now the necessity for mentioning and making reference to these particular writs is quite obvious these writs have been in existence in great britain for a number of years their nature and remedies that they provided are known to every lawyer and consequently we thought that as it is impossible even for a man who had a most fertile imagination to invent something new it was hardly possible to improve upon the writs which have been in existence for probably thousands of years and which have given complete satisfaction to every english man with regard to the protection of his freedom we therefore thought that a situation such as the one which existed in the english jurisprudence which con- con- contain these writs and which if i may say so have been found to be nail proof and full proof ought to be mentioned by their name in the constitution without prejudice to the right of the supreme court to do justice in some other way if it felt it was desirable to do so now you just think of article 1 to meet the ends of the states they can do anything that's why the doctor ambedkar has said that see even a fertile person with all imagination it is difficult to invent something but we have invented such sorrowful mandalas <laughs> yes and we have invented writ of declaration it's only an hybrid version it's nothing new and what the, the, the absolute writs we i have read for that purpose we can invent n number of things but everything can be Uh, encompassed within this five rights and that's the reason why yes it's so and further i therefore think that i need make no apology for explaining the nature of these rights anyone who knows anything about the english law will realize and understand that the rights which are referred to in the article fall into two categories they are called in one sense prerogative rights in the other sense they are called rights in action a writ of mandamus writ of prohibition writ of certiorari can be used or applied for both it can be used as a prerogative writ or it may be applied by a litigant in the course of a suit or proceedings the importance of these writs which are given by this article lies in the fact that they are prerogative writs they can be sought for by an aggrieved party without bringing any proceedings or suit ordinarily you must first file a suit before you can get any kind of order from the court whether the order is of a nature of mandamus prohibition or certiorari or anything of the kind but here so far as this article is concerned without filing any proceedings you can straight away go to the court and apply for the writ 
the object of the writ is really to grant what i may call interim relief for instance if a man is arrested without filing a suit or proceedings against the officer who arrested him he can file a petition to the court for setting him at liberty it is not necessary for him to file a suit or a proceeding against the officer in a proceeding of this kind that the applications for a prerogative is all that the court can do is to ascertain whether the arrest is in accordance with law the court at that stage will not enter into the question whether the law under which a person is arrested is good law or bad law whether it conflicts with any of the provisions of the constitution or whether it does not conflict all that the court can inquire in a habeas corpus proceeding is whether arrest is lawful and will not enter into the question at least that is the practice of the court so it will not look into this this is how the debate went on and finally we got this article 32 which reads as below the right to move the supreme court by appropriate proceedings for the enforcement of the right conferred by this part is guaranteed the supreme court shall have the power to issue directions or order or writs including writs in the nature of habeas corpus mandamus prohibition quarantum and such other right which or may be appropriate for the enforcement of any of the rights conferred by this part this is how they have finalized the article and without prejudice now yet another clause which also came for debate that clause is suspension of this right in case of emergency the article 220 uh, 352 to 355 see that in case of emergency certain rights can be suspended and for that purpose that article also came for debate and they have given, uh, given an answer why it should be there Uh, without prejudice to the powers conferred on the supreme court by clause 1 and 2 parliament may make law empower any other court to exercise within the local limits of jurisdiction all or any of the powers exercised by the supreme court that has not happened the right guaranteed by this article shall not be suspended except as otherwise provided for by this constitution some of them said why this clause it should be deleted but good sense prevailed upon them they said that there may be are uh, uh, the word use is this we are in the nascent stage we are in a, we have a not we have not yet uh, stabilized our democracy is not uh, stable till we stabilize this clause must be there to save the uh, to pro, uh, protect from internal disturbance and external aggressions whatever it is something is hap- uh, happens then article 32 we can keep article 32 predominantly and fight with the external thing so till we stabilize at least for 5 years or so this article must be there and this article was there this was used abused and uh, 74 75 amendments were brought in and those amendments later on after 2 or uh, 3 years we uh, we are we are able to set right it and we are marching forward and therefore this article at times uh, may cre- uh, create some problem but it is all um, aggression of power to say so if the person who has the power but uh, have more uh, respect to the constitution then that thing will not happen and who have mutual respect to the other wing of the constitution this will not happen and this is what uh, sir kamath wanted to remove what i have read if uh, um, kamath wanted to remove the mention of specific rights in the provision he felt that this would constrain judges they would not be able to evolve new rights in the future uh his prophecy uh, became wrong and uh, though dr amritkar has said that there cannot be any further writ there may be writ in future but we can evolve it and put it in within the framework of these five writs and uh, tajamul hussein is the person who sought deletion of the clause four that allowed for suspension of right during an emergency which he turned termed it as a dangerous situation he said it's a dangerous situation so that uh, of four must be removed whereas the other members said that if you don't remove it we will be in danger therefore let it be there it never so we are not going to exercise frequently accordingly it may we may exercise when such occasion arises if there is no provision then we will be at uh, some difficult situation therefore let it be there so Uh, i have read this explanation so therefore i don't want to read it again now article 226 uh, i have already uh, 
pointed out the difference um, how 2032 and 226 differs and uh, i think that may also may not be read again now some interesting thing this is for present so so far what i have said is past constitution present i will start with ak gopalan please we declared republic on 26th january we hardly month ordinance was promulgated in state of madras that is on 26 2 and it became an act preventive detention act 1950 and one of the clause it is something like act 14 and a, a rude form of act 14 and one of the section in that preventive detention act is that a person who is detained he can be detained for 6 months a person who can detain cannot approach any court of law for any remedy that is one of the things ek gopalan is a communist leader from 1947 he had been detained in prison for one reason or other whenever he gets bail another case will be poisoned he will be put in prison from 1947 he was if he was in prison with some short intervals after this we got uh, we, uh, we became republic in the month of january the month of february this act came into force and in the month of march that is hardly 5 days after this enactment ak gopalan who got bail 3 days ago arrested under this act and detained under this act and put in prison and he challenged the entire act, saying that it is violative of article 14 19 21 22 came before six judges bench who should be put somebody said that no when article 226 is there uh, 32 you need not invoke that uh, constitution will said no he can come and even he said that right of movement right to move anywhere in the country within the union of india means i have a locomotive right by preventively detaining me my locomotive right is curtailed my right of movement is curtailed five judges said no no right to life is one different article article 21 you are alive therefore you cannot say that article 21 is violated right to move subject to restriction 19 1 a restriction is under 192 therefore you cannot say that restricting your locomotive right is violative of article 19 a five judges said so. so literally what the judgment said is your existence is sufficient right to life means you exist that is sufficient and uh locomotive right is not an absolute right so personal liberty been discussed and defined in a particular way except one judge fazil ali said that no no see you have to encompass 19 and 21 you have to read together they are not they it's all in there. nature law has given us some fundamental right you by way of a constitution or law you define what are what are those rights even without constitution those rights are to be protected whereas in our constitution we say that these rights will be protected under article these are the rights are, those rights are defined and uh, article 32 says it will be protected so your detention order is bad without giving any reason why he is detained and so far as the class 14 is concerned everybody said that yes but he must have a, any person who detained must have a legal remedy he must come to the court he must right to approach the court is there the 14 prohibits that therefore 14 alone is ultra virus to the constitution all other sections are legally valid that is how in ak gopalan case our constitution been tested very important articles of our constitution was tested by and uh, were discussed by six eminent judges of our court and they have given this finding and at the point of time 75 years ago you can just imagine that 
that should have been the way of decision making because they, they have given reasoning why they have arrived at that conclusion and personally with all foresight he said that see don't uh, give so much power to the executives personal liberty means it must be cherished by all and uh, you can't say that uh, uh, you are alive vegetable existence is sufficient and uh, the article uh, you know, 21 is not violated is not correct thing don't give little meaning to no person shall be deprived of his life and liberty without the procedure established under law don't do that and it took some years to review that and in ak gopalan case supreme court restricted the meaning of article 19 of the indian constitution stated that only a free man can enjoy freedom under 19 this means that when a person is under detention he cannot enjoy the freedom given under article 19 it also added that article 19 and 21 of the indian constitution are not related to each other as article 21 is guaranteed against loss of personal liberty in contrast article 21 provides protection against unreasonable restriction moreover the court clarified that procedure established by law and due process of law that is the principle of natural justice are different from each other that is how when they compared the uh, us uh, constitution and uh, 14th amendment they said that no no this is different and that is different for india uh, uh, right to life means if you safe in the prison it's more, more than enough that is how they said and same uh, dissenting judgment is also worth uh, reading uh, uh, justice fazil ali said prohibition have to be constitutional except uh, that is what the uh, judgment said he uh, in his dissent judgment he said that act does not was not favoring this that he said that detaining someone without valid reason and justification for his detention is illegal it will it will amount to violating article 21 so without reason and without justification if a person is detained it violates article 21 that is what fazil ali said this judgment was delivered somewhere in 19 uh, on 19th may 1920 almost Uh, 1950 sorry 1950 uh, january republic february order march arrest this is may now same period within a week or so another case came that is ramesh tapar case that many of you may know ramesh tapar case is something connected with freedom of speech and expression this is life and liberty this judgment is you know almost all, uh, the very same judge except two judges the same composition there was one magazine uh, one news paper called crossroads published and printed in mumbai it had a wide circulation in uh, tamil nadu it carried some seditious article so state of tamil nadu thought that this should not this paper should not enter circulate within state of madras they there was an act at that time exercising the power under the act they uh, passed a ban order this should not come here like we have passed some uh, orders we used now also we used to see this picture should not be screened here this uh, that uh, this book should not be released here all those things like right those days they said no we should not come here and that the act is that madras maintenance of public order act 1949 entry distribution and suppression of paper was prohibited that was challenged again they said that how he can come directly to the supreme court under article 32 let him go under article 26 and this order violates freedom of speech and expression and this order uh, whether uh, this order involving menace to the peace and tranquility of the province and affecting public safety will be a matter which undermines the security of the state or not now a fine distinction and discussion will be uh, is made in this statement regarding public safety what is meant by public safety and security of the state to put it in nutshell in short they said that public safety is something localized one between the society or in that street or in that house or in that area it's a public safety where security of state is a larger issue therefore you can't interchange these two expression 
public uh, safety and security of the state are different so unless the security of state is under peril you can't ban uh, or restrict a person is freedom of expression and speech because the restriction under article 19 is only regarding security of the state not public peace that is how they said and this is the descending judgment whereas Basil Ali now said that again these are not two different things one will enlarge into security of the if you allow some disturbance in the public peace that will get enlarged in a later point of time it will be a threat to the security of the state it is all interchangeable only thing is whether there is an application of mind whether there is really the reasoning is achievable no arbitrariness you can run this, this is all simultaneously same period this time came in. for some time this this thought was going around and it was holding the field till after emergency when menaga gandhi want to go abroad and the case was against her then the central government thought that she should not go her passport was impounded she approached the supreme court said that she right of freedom right to move includes right to go abroad you impose any condition i'll come back you can't prohibit me or prevent me from going abroad court said yes and this was seven judges bench which said that right to travel abroad is the integral part of fundamental right then this present scenario of ritualist you know, stops is case putasa you all know that this judgment touches upon the uh, privacy right of privacy but they have discussed all the thing march of law future how it's going to be what is to be done how the privacy can be protected how the right of expression and other thing can be uh, they have contemplated certain things that you written in a very uh, interesting manner and this judgment has over ruled two judgments which was holding the field for nearly 50 years or so and those two judgments also have a very significant thing that is uh, touching upon the domicile visit domicile visit of a huge person those days uh, even now i a police uh, is bound to do that yes issue sheets they have to uh, keep the uh, issue sheets under uh, scanner they have to monitor his whereabouts if anything untoward happens anywhere they will immediately see that whether this man is uh, here what is uh, where he was at the time of that occurrence whether he is involved in the crime or so when he is an habitual offender of that particular crime that's how they do it but that was challenged supreme court said that see surveillance is part of the police job you can't say that my every day of police is standing in my front of his house and uh, that affects my privacy you be in your house nobody is going to barge into your house and even if they come into your house and make some inquiry it is permissible that is how in mp sharma case 1954 supreme court said yes that was being accepted and followed all along now in putas and case we are over that cannot be done. not only physical surveillance even by uh, electronic surveillance whatever it is that is not permissible unless and until it is necessary for the interest of the nation you cannot do it like uh, as and when required or whatever it is. that is how this statement so from ak gopalan till the same case with the present scenario that's how rid you decision has developed more modified or metamorphism of the ritual system of things. Now the future. Future, I have some judgments to say. So before that, this Marbury versus Madison, this uh, slide I have added is because of one particular reason. This fundamental right, we have the ritual decision predominantly to protect fundamental right and fundamental right is not Uh, came into existence when the constitution came into existence it's a pre existing right any human being the day he come to this world he gets a fundamental right it's a natural right what we say in 32 and 226 and all in our judgment we redefine it we reinforce it that's all so that's why, uh, that's why 
or in marbury vs madison that's a very quite interesting case where uh, in usa president can appoint uh, judges oh, an outgoing ju- president will appoint his man of his choice that is the challenge they said that it's uh, arbitrary it's uh, everything but law says he has a right to appoint him so therefore that cannot be questioned but what he has done is wrong he should have appointed a better person or he should not have appointed allow the is incumbent to do it but we can't say that it is wrong it's legally it's not wrong. that's how they did and in that judgment marshal it is the duty of the courts when confronted with a conflict between an act statute of the mere agent of the people that is act is created by agent of the people that is legislation and the act of the people themselves that is constitution to prefer the latter so constitution should be preferred what he mean is see you take if you take the constitution preamble we say we the people of india declare to ourselves we give this constitution to ourselves this is the act of the public people that is constitution the legislation are our act of our representatives so when there is a conflict between a legislation and constitution constitution must be given predominance not the legislation that is why whenever a legislation is made in a subordinate legislation act or rule is uh, framed we test it with the touchstone of constitution whether first of all we start with the part 7 of the constitution whether under which uh, the list it comes and whether they have competency in legislation all right they are competent whether that legislation clears the other test whether it violates the fundamental right or not or whether it uh, it is repugnant to the any other legislation or not whether the pith and substance of the legislation is to uh, you uh, use the user the power of the other uh, thing or whether the state legislation or the central legislation occupy the field if it is in the uh, concurrent list if it is already occupied by the union list union legislation or central legislation state cannot do it except getting assent from the president this is how the constitution is okay. and they, without doing that sometimes they may do it we test it and the provisions of the constitution okay now reason that not i'll rush it's already time to so, uh this hijab case you no know, what to see uh, where to live in jail or uh, free was earlier concern of our city there then whether we can go abroad or not is the subsequent concern now what to wear and uh, what to eat these are all the latest development and we are asked to decide uh, whether that can be done or not we are doing it and for that purpose this aisha sipa versus state of karnataka we have this it up uh, two judges went to supreme court delivered a split opinion and therefore it has uh, so uh, to gather information in criminal trial this copalakishan state of kerala 2020 98cc 161 deals about furnishing the copy 209 papers the papers whether that has been furnished or not all those things now supreme court has seized of the matter and uh, they are giving the direction left right center to the state and the high court to make amend the criminal law rules of practice also criminal rules of practice also they want to do it because they want to uh, bring out the pan india uh, procedure uh, many states are very very I mean, still rudimentary state but our state has uh, gone uh, far ahead but they want to make it and, uh, and uh, this is all this judgment is one such thing and the right to health of senior citizens and for allegation old age home this is dr ashwini kumar is another uh, public interest litigation demonetization case 10 person ew these are all some of the cases now uh, we go uh, now the recent trend regarding federalism federalist state central relationship state central relationship after the gst regime after the gst regime which has a uh, 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 a sort of a combination where the taxation provision uh, imposing uh, taxation provisions and constitution has been now revisited relooked and revamped and uh, 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 a cons- uh, taxing regime which will have the role of central and state whatever it is except uh, direct taxes all indirect taxes is now brought under this gst regime state and central 
are equally collecting tax whatever it is if it is 10% gst 5% to the state 5% and later that is been shared and distributed to them. this is how it works and there is a council gst council this gst council consists of representative of each state they go and how they decide gst council act clearly says it should uh, it should be headed by the person who is from the opposite party or from the state not by the union representative union three fourth of the members it should be unanimously passed any resolution any decision or at least three fourth should uh, support it this is how it's working for, for the past few years and this was challenged and in mohit menadam case the supreme court has evolved this concept that we we are why i'm saying this is one of the important thing is now constitution fundamental right and other thing right to trade is now gaining momentum and issues arising for the high, supreme court and high court to decide now the individual fundamental rights and other thing are all now been well settled and taken care of now we are moving towards the economic part of the thing sale of goods transaction transport and other thing so now the nature of writs filed and query raised or placed before the courts for decision is more towards commercial and the, our view also change supreme court has also now given more importance to commercial disputes that's the reason why the commercial courts act have come into force they want is, uh, exclusive court for commercial dispute and uh, the traditional disputes and litigants uh, given second uh, great treatment and all the good facilities uh, importance and uh, been given to the commercial dispute and the supreme court is also now being forced to uh, decide these issues that is quite natural after globalization opening the market and we have uh, raising the ladder we are uh, trying to reach this state uh, slot one or two at least uh, in next few years it bound to happen and supreme court is bound to answer this and unfortunate thing is judges are not trained to decide all these issues they are very difficult to say whether 15% solution should be given or 30% if 30% is given how much should be given we will take 20 minutes or 30 minutes for us to calculate even in a motor accident case you know <laughs> but now we are asked to decide in a dispute whether uh, the uh, taxable component of this product is to be assessed to on the whole or only to the raw materials which are taxable in different rate of tax and all these things it is very technical that is why the tribunal has come uh, tribunal taxation term other thing has been uh, now uh, become the order of the day because it consists of an expert and he will decide and answer all these things law we can do it what is the law say whether it is taxable or not all these things now in such scenario when state and central unlike uh, pre gst regime the list is there based on the list you can impose tax those uh, the subject which falls under the state list state will be at liberty to impose tax at any rate or no tax whatever it is but now that is not the power of the state to fix its own thing for the goods which falls under the gst uh, list is not possible now. so therefore interaction with the state and central is getting more and more so when it is sharing money sharing water sharing money sharing boundary is always a uh, uh, it's a bone of contention it's a area of conflict so all this thing now brought to the uh, consideration of the court and they are asked to decide and one such thing more mineral case this case in the federal they have uh, they have pointed out that federalism there are two kinds one is competitive federalism and cooperative federalism what is now required is not competitive federalism but cooperative federalism so that state and the central cooperate with each other become a federal now go back to the basic in localization still now we are been taught that india is a quasi federal indian constitution is a quasi federal it is neither a union nor a federal but this quasi federal we thought india consider the union of india consists of states and provinces uh, that's all the constitution also reads india that is bharat but 
and dicey has in everybody has said that indian constitution is quasi federal and one uh, great jurist long time before emergency said that this indian constitution can be converted into a uh, union uh, unitary form of government presidential form of government uh, uh, parliament form of government can be converted into presidential form of government with little peating your constitution indira gandhi attempted that in fact and she also succeeded see i will uh, there is time i will read one portion one small portion of the constitutional debate after emergency when article 39 was uh, uh, amendment 39th amendment was brought in they want to increase the life of the parliament to 6 years uh, lok sabha they said that rajya sabha life is 6 years why not lok sabha 6 years that was opposed by oppositions opposition members everybody opposed at that time congress party had more than 352 members the total strength of the indian uh, lok sabha was 518 but it was vehemently opposed by many leaders more particularly indrajit gupta of communist party so what they did is see we are going to increase the life of the parliament uh, assembly uh, lok sabha for 6 years you are going to be a beneficiary you need not stand for election for another one year one year life is extended why you are opposing it at that time this was the very emphatic argument it was very interesting also i just uh, wonder it is not that uh, always our parliamentarians are uh, uh, bad really it is only our uh, uh, bad impression they are far far better than us ask me me us ada 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 idu mari da ade ada anju varsha agra unikku na inno oru 3 varsha irupane avanga sonnaanga le adhe da adhu paarenga indrajit gupta nu oru 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 sensible parliamentarian avaru patti ellarume theriyum avaru vandu avar solraaru that's the reason why i just want to read that one particular thing how kamath the laws minister try to press up on this amendment and how uh, i'll just read what uh, gokhale uh, uh, hr gupta first uh, he say opposes it for which gokhale answers for example you can defeat me or i can defeat you i can defeat you because you have a sincere belief in the democratic process i can understand if mr indrajit gupta stands for election against me maybe he will defeat me or i will defeat him but if somebody stands for election against me whose sole purpose is to destroy the election process how can you defeat him at the polls when you say that they do not believe that there is something like a democratic process and create disorder by process which are not democratic therefore this argument may apply to you but will not apply to the others to whom i am referring this is how he put forth the bill indrajit gupta has uh, uh, put forth this uh uh argument saying that he that's not required you need not be in uh, comedy with uh, life of the you are bringing this amendment with an ulterior motive your president your party leader election declared as void by virtue of some interim order passed by the supreme court you are surviving you want to amend the constitution itself you have already amended you are going further amending after amending 42nd amendment you have it's a mini constitution you have changed the structure of the constitution we will not allow it if you allow you to be here for one more year you will destroy this sacred thing we will not allow it whether we are facing election whether you win or i win that is something different it's left to the public people but we will not allow you to be here for another one year but that is not that is how yes wherever it was a firebrand argument and unfortunately i have not brought it uh, i don't know how i missed it but this is how brother the constitution uh, been uh, of this uh, resolution been traveled all along and uh, the uh, recent uh, judgments which indicates that we are moving towards an um, economic centric uh, country and therefore our predominance and our concentration is going to be towards that all other thing will be given uh, secondary treatment and uh, but any whatever we do whatever we try to protect 
the constitution must be protected because the fabric of the nation is reflected in the constitution once you touch the constitution destroy it then you can't uh, save the fabric of the nation also supreme court said that citizens have a right to information relating to court proceedings except in case of in camera proceedings this includes the right to know the observation remarks made by the judge during the course of hearing which do not form part of the judgment the media is free to report exchange of legal arguments before court it must be accessible and that is the reason why now we are going towards the uh, telecasting live telecasting of the this is all this this is one uh, area that right of expression uh, right of uh, free speech and while uh, giving full liberty we now come out confront with the hate speech now hate speech somebody says that what is that how can hate speech be uh, brought under the freedom of uh, expression supreme court is now asked to decide well, can, can we permit hate speech that is kaushal kishore versus state of up 2023 very recent judgment on online acc so no ground outside article 192 can be availed to restrict free speech the supreme court while relying upon the transformative jurisprudence relating to interpretation of article 19 and 21 of the constitution has held that initial understanding that fundamental rights can only be claimed against the state has changed and today rights under 19 and 21 can also be enforced against persons other than the state or its instrument that is how we are expanding this with this i stop now we are, our focus is now towards other freedom and our focus is now enlarged not only to the state and instrumentality of the state even individuals should be brought under the rule of uh, writ and this is how the future of our judiciary is going to happen let wait and see thank you we the members of bar have decided to challenge dr b r ambedkar's words your honor we are inventing a new writ called writ of acceptance we seek writ of acceptance from your lordship for many other lectures like this thank you for the wonderful lecture lordship the gratitude is the completion of thankfulness may i now request mr c prithviraj coordinator of legal literacy club mmba to propose word of thanks good evening to all i deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the word of thanks on this memorable occasion first and foremost i take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to our honorable dr justice g jayachandran the dynamic and flexible person in all academic matters for gracing this occasion even in the midst of his busy schedule thank you lord chief i express my heartfelt thanks to mr dilip kumar chairman legal literacy club who always been a rock of support i express my grateful to the president of mmba mr s srinivasan raghavan and general secretary of mmba mr k p n narayan kumar for their words of encouragement guidance and kindness i thank the members of legal literacy club mr jay lawrence mr v minakshi sundaram mr jerin matthew and mr ms pathiban for their support and commitment to bring this event a successful i thank all the senior advocates advocates brother and sister advocates who have graciously accepted our invitation and made this event a grand success i thank the office bearers of mmba and office staff of, of the mmba for supporting us and finally i thank mr ms pathiban master of ceremony for his wonderful way with words thank you i thank to the one who thanked everyone a special thanks to the technical assistant kali 